1955, a monumental aircraft appears in Soviet skies. It is the Tupolev Tu-95 Bear. The fastest propeller-driven aircraft in the world, it is capable of dropping nuclear weapons in the heartland of America. Russia became fascinated with large bombers very early. In 1912, Igor Sikorsky began to build the huge Bolshoi Baltiski, the Baltic Grand, the world's first four-engined aeroplane. This is a replica of its successor, the Ilya Muromets, which was larger still. It had a wingspan of 113 feet and weighed about five tons. Almost 80 Ilya Muromets bombers were built. They served the Imperial Russian Air Service with distinction in World War I. In Soviet Russia in 1917, the new Red Air Force was neglected. The leaders of the Soviet state allowed the assets of the old Imperial Air Service to run down. In a country where the horse was still a military weapon, support for aviation was not widespread. But slowly, the value of the aeroplane was recognized. Aircraft and spare parts were salvaged. Factories were reopened. From 1917 to 1920, as the Civil War swept through Russia, the Red Army used aircraft primarily for reconnaissance. Most of the fighting took place on the ground, involving men, horses, and guns. In January 1924, Vladimir Lenin, the Soviet leader, died. No one was powerful enough to succeed him as a clear-cut leader. Joseph Stalin was a member of the Troika, a group of three men who replaced Lenin at the head of the Communist Party and the state. By this time, Soviet aviation was beginning to recover from the effects of brain drain and neglect. The Society of Friends of the Air Fleet set out to raise interest in flight and money to build planes. They aimed straight at the people of the Soviet state for support. Their slogans, workers build an air fleet and proletariat take to the air, were designed to identify industrial workers with the new air force. Their first squadron of aircraft formed in 1922 was named in memory of Lenin. In 1925, Stalin was engaged in a political struggle to gain sole leadership of the Soviet state and of the Communist Party. At the same time, young, bright Soviet designers were beginning to emerge from the new academies. The Central Aero and Hydrodynamics Institute, known as Tsagi, was established in late 1918. By the mid-twenties, it was well on its way to becoming the Soviet Union's most important center for aerodynamic research. Tsagi had an interest in big aircraft from the beginning. In 1919, its founder, Nikolai Zhukovsky, proposed the design of a large transport aircraft. A prototype was built, but was not successful. At the time, Tsagi's chief designer was Andrei Tupolev. 
He was influenced by the German Junkers Company's use of metal in aircraft construction. He also used Sagi's design and test facilities to work towards the production of large, long-range aircraft for bombers or transports. Throughout the 20s and into the 30s, Sagi's test facilities expanded. Its wind tunnels, in particular, became essential tools for a Soviet aircraft industry that was beginning to throw off the influence of foreign designers and develop an identity of its own. Tupolev's first really large aircraft, the AMT-4, flew in 1925, the world's first all-metal twin-engined monoplane heavy bomber. It was an extremely successful design, but for Tupolev, it was just one of a long series of extraordinary large aircraft. The ANT-9 flew in May 1929. It was a nine-passenger airliner that proved its long-range capability by flying from Moscow to London and back via Berlin in 53 flying hours. It was just one of a number of major long-distance flights by Tupolev aircraft in the 20s and 30s. The AMT-6 of 1930 was the first Soviet four-engined heavy bomber. It was also produced as a troop carrier with room for 30 fully equipped soldiers. The Soviet strategic bombing policy was based on this aircraft. With the ANT-4, it made the Soviet bomber force the largest in the world at the time. More than 800 ANT-6s were built, and it remained in service right through the 1930s. In June 1933, Andrei Tupolev's remarkable ANT-25 flew for the first time. Its wingspan was 111 feet, but the fuselage was only 44 feet long. It had fuel tanks in the wings, retractable landing gear, and only one engine. Theoretically, at least, it could stay in the air for 100 hours. It was built on the orders of Stalin as a record-breaking aircraft, but was also thought to have potential as a long-range bomber. It never became a bomber, but it certainly broke records. In September 1934, an ANT-25 made a non-stop closed circuit flight of almost 8,000 miles, a record that was not broken until the 1970s. In June and July 1937, ANT-25s flew non-stop from Moscow to America by way of the North Pole on two separate occasions, staying in the air for more than 60 hours on each flight. The June flight to Portland, Washington, covered 5,300 miles, and the second to San Jacinto, near Los Angeles in California, was 1,000 miles longer. In 1934 came Tupolev's most extraordinary aircraft, at least in terms of size. The project began in 1932 when the Union of Soviet Writers and Editors raised six million rubles for the construction of a giant aircraft to carry the name of the Russian writer Maxim Gorky and to create a Maxim Gorky propaganda squadron. The aircraft Tupolev designed was metal. It had a wingspan of 206 feet and was powered by eight engines of 900 horsepower each. It flew for the first time on May the 19th, 1934, and then joined the Maxim Gorky squadron for propaganda flights all over the Soviet Union, showering pamphlets, broadcasting messages and music from its loudspeakers, and even projecting images onto clouds. The Maxim Gorky was the world's largest land plane of the time. Its potential as a bomber design was not lost on the West. It could fly over a thousand miles without refueling. It was faster than many fighters. But almost exactly a year after its first flight, it crashed, brought down by an escort fighter 
performing unauthorized aerobatics. In spite of Soviet achievements in the design of heavy long-range aircraft in the 30s, by the time World War II broke out, there was only one long-range strategic bomber in the Soviet infantry. It was the Petlyakov PE-8. The PE-8 project began under Tupolev in 1936, but was delegated to the Petlyakov Bureau in 1938. Petlyakov had been wing designer on a number of major Tupolev aircraft. For its time, it was an advanced design. The PE-8 entered service in 1940 and took part in retaliatory raids on Berlin in 1941. But losses were heavy and such long-range raids were not persevered with. The PE-8 was used regularly throughout the war to fly VIPs to conferences of allies in Britain and in America. In its final form, it was at least as fast and its range at least as long as the multi-engined bombers of Britain and America. But the pressure in the Great Patriotic War was for small twin-engine tactical bombers and the PE-8 was never produced in quantity. The introduction of the extraordinary Boeing B-29 was an event of great importance to the outcome of the war. The United States now had an aircraft of unprecedented long-range, high-altitude performance. Throughout the war, the Soviets had made repeated requests to the Allies for a four-engine bomber to replace the PE-8. There was no response. The Soviets had already seen the need for a future strategic air force, given the massive striking power Britain and America now possessed. Then, in August and November 1944, three USAF B-29s landed on Soviet territory in the Far East after running low on fuel. Stalin had been presented with a windfall gift in the shape of the world's most advanced strategic bomber. Tupolev was ordered to copy the airframe, and Shvitsov, the engine designer, to copy the right whirlwind engines. Just one year later, the prototype Tu-4, the Soviet copy of the B-29, was flying. In April 1946, the Soviet long-range air force was revived. In 1947, Western authorities were shocked to see the first three pre-production Tu-4s flying in the Aviation Day Parade. It took two years to complete the flight test program, and the Tu-4 did not enter service until 1949. In the United States, the B-29 was already obsolete. But the Tu-4, codenamed by NATO Bull, was produced in quantity. One and a half thousand were built before production ended in 1954. The end of the Great Patriotic War in 1945 was a great turning point in the history of the Soviet Union. Four years of extreme struggle had ended in victory. For a population that had been totally committed to resisting Hitler's invasion and turning it back on itself, celebration was sweet. The task of rebuilding the ravaged nation was immense. The litter of war was gathered, committed to furnaces, and melted down. But the steel of the German guns and helmets and tanks and trucks would not all be reformed into post-war equivalents of plowshares. 
As the Soviet nation was marshaled to rebuild, the Kremlin confronted a new world strategic situation. The possibility of another war, a war between East and West, was looming. If the United States could drop a nuclear bomb on Hiroshima, it could equally deposit one on Leningrad. And the Soviet military had little knowledge of radar early warning systems or jet engine design or surface-to-air defenses. At the Paris Peace Conference in 1946, U.S. Secretary of State Burns summarized the situation from the American point of view. Members of the conference, we must try to understand one another even when we cannot agree with one another. We must never accept any disagreement as final. We must work together until we can find solutions which, while not perfect, are solutions which can be defended. A world longing for peace will not forgive us if in striving for perfection we fail to obtain peace. The United States believes that those who fought the war should make the peace. The 1947 May Day Parade in Red Square continued the pre-war Soviet tradition of mammoth shows of military strength. In spite of the scale of the display, Stalin knew that Soviet military technology was lagging behind the West. The great Convair B-36 could fly 6,800 miles and carry 84,000 pounds of bombs. Its appearance forced the Soviets to develop a large version of their B-29 copy, but by the time it was ready, America had leapfrogged into the age of the intercontinental jet bomber. In April 1947, Berliners struggled with floods and a Soviet blockade of their city, which aimed to force the Americans and British out of the former German capital. In poor weather conditions, one of the American aircraft flying supplies into Berlin crashed. It was the beginning of an airlift in which British and American planes flew thousands of tons of food a day over the Soviet blockade. What was now being referred to as the Cold War deepened. Relations between the West and the Soviet Union reached new levels of stress. After three months of blockade, the situation was deadlocked and in September 1948, the question of the reunification of Berlin was submitted to the United Nations. This is Dr. Philip Jessup of the American delegation giving his country's view of Soviet action in Berlin. Soviet government, using the harsh instrument of the blockade, has indeed chosen a strange way in Berlin to live up to this agreement to democratize German political life. Thanks to the air bridge and to the support given it by the Berliners, the Soviet government has not succeeded in its purpose. Now, Mr. President, as I pointed out to the Security Council before, we could have used our armed force against the Soviet threat, or we could have meekly submitted and surrendered our rights and duties in Berlin, subjecting nearly two and a half million Germans the Soviet rule with all that that implies. What we actually did, and what we're still doing, is to live up to our obligations under the Charter of the United Nations and try to settle the question by peaceful discussion while continuing to discharge our obligations in Berlin. By May 1949, the blockade was over, but the Western powers had formed NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, a united front against the Soviet Union. By 1952, the world political situation had become even more tense. The Soviet Union had announced that it possessed nuclear weapons. 
and America had tested the hydrogen bomb. The Communist German Democratic Republic had been established, so had the People's Republic of China. The Korean War was continuing. In America, General Dwight Eisenhower ran for the presidency and won a landslide victory on the side of the Republican Party. It wasn't the only radical change in world leadership. In March 1953, Joseph Stalin, who had been the power behind the Soviet Union for almost 30 years, had a stroke and died. Western analysts looked for the emergence of a clear successor. They found it in the secretary of the Central Committee of the Communist Party, Nikita Khrushchev. The prototype of the Boeing B-52 Stratofortress flew for the first time in April 1952 and immediately transformed the balance of air power between the Soviet Union and the United States. Even though it would not enter service for some years, it was a vast technological leap beyond the B-29 and the B-36. It could fly halfway around the world without refueling and reach speeds close to the speed of sound. It was an impressive aircraft and would remain the symbol of American intercontinental air power for 30 years. But while America led the intercontinental strategic bomber race in 1952, it was not by as much as Westerners may have imagined. This is the Tupolev Tu-16, codenamed the Badger by NATO. It made its first flight at about the same time as the B-52, and while it did not match the B-52's range or speed, it was still a major achievement for Soviet aviation. The Tu-16 could fly at more than 600 miles an hour, and its range of 3,000 miles could be extended by aerial refueling from the wingtip of a tanker version of the same aircraft. The Tu-16 was not intended to compete directly with the B-52. It was designed as a medium-range bomber and closely matched the performance of the American medium jet bomber of the time, the Boeing B-47. Almost 2,000 Tu-16s were produced for the long-range air force and the naval air forces between 1952 and 1958. The Tu-16 originated from a Red Air Force request for a replacement for the Tu-4. The two main design bureaus in the competition were Tupolev and Ilyushin. Ilyushin already had a successful jet bomber, the IL-28, in service. They chose simply to scale it up to a larger version. But Tupolev was developing a completely new design. And when the Ilyushin and Tupolev prototypes flew off against each other, the Tupolev aircraft was superior. It went into production as the Tu-16. The Ilyushin competitor, the IL-42, was an old-fashioned straight-winged aircraft with its jet engines in large wing pods, but the Tu-16 was a thoroughly modern design. Its advanced aerodynamic features placed it on a par with any comparable Western aircraft. It had swept wings with a span of 108 feet. Its two engines were recessed smoothly into the sides of the fuselage at the wing roots. The engine nacelles themselves were more slender in the middle than at the front or back, giving a wasted effect that was intended to reduce drag. The Tu-16 carried a crew of six. Two were gunners. The forward dorsal gunner operated from a bubble on top of the fuselage. There were two pilots in the main cockpit and the navigator was housed in the glazed nose section. This is the bomb site, but not all Badgers were bombers. During its long service life, NATO identified at least 11 different variations. 
Some were naval anti-shipping versions, and others were used for electronic surveillance. The 2U-16 can carry up to 8,000 pounds of bombs in its internal bomb bay. Now, it could also carry missiles under the wings or a standoff bomb under the fuselage. The rear gunner was housed in a turret right in the tail of the aircraft. The fin and rudder were mounted high on top of the fuselage to keep them well above the level of the wings and engines. The Tu-16 was an extremely successful aircraft with a very long service life. It was still being produced in China in the 1980s and some Tu-16s are still operational in Russia. The civilian derivative, the Tu-104, was one of the first jet airliners to go into service anywhere in the world. This is the Miasischiff Atlant. It's the civilian version of the Miasischiff M4, known to NATO as the Bison, the Soviet Union's first attempt at a genuine intercontinental jet bomber. The Atlant was developed in the mid-80s to transport the Soviet space shuttle, the Buran, on its back. The large tank this one is carrying is used for liquid hydrogen, also for the shuttle program. Apart from its large twin vertical tails and the carrying attachment on the fuselage, the Atlant is basically the same as its ancestor, which was first seen in public at the Soviet Aviation Day fly-past in 1954. The Bison was the Soviet Union's first serious attempt to match the B-52 and build a heavy jet bomber with intercontinental range. It was a response to Joseph Stalin's 1949 order for work to begin on a jet bomber capable of flying to the USA and back. When the prototype of the Mershishchev M4 was finished, it was called the Molot, the Hammer. Andrei Tupolev, knowing that Soviet jet engines were not sufficiently developed to satisfy Stalin's demand, chose not to compete with Myasishchev and instead concentrated on the development of a turboprop engine capable of powering a large aircraft. Stalin's requirement was that the intercontinental bomber be capable of flying 10,000 miles. Mersishchev used four of the same jet engines that powered Tupolev Tu-16, but they were not capable of delivering Stalin's range. Mersishchev had been given special resources to build this mammoth aircraft. A new factory was built, and he was given a free hand to recruit 1,500 designers and technicians from other design bureaus. The Bison was not as big as its American opponent, the B-52. Its wingspan was 20 feet less. Its maximum takeoff weight of 350,000 pounds compared with the B-52's half a million. There were similarities, however. The main landing gear was housed in a fuselage in a tandem arrangement similar to the B-52's. Like the landing gear of all Russian aircraft, it was massive. For stability, the tips of the drooping wings were fitted with small outrigger wheels. When the prototype was completed and tested in flight, it was a disappointment. 
Mirsishchev's hammer was not the tool to strike fear into the Cold War hearts of the American population. Instead of Stalin's 10,000 miles, the bison could only manage five and a half. Turbofan engines, which were more powerful and economical, were fitted to later versions. But by then, Khrushchev was concentrating resources on strategic rockets. And Andrei Tupolev's giant turboprop bomber, the Bear, was in operation. Bison continued to be produced, but never in large numbers. Their prime role switched to long-range naval operations, and some were converted as tankers. They began to be phased out of service in the mid-80s. At the Geneva summit in July 1955, the reunification of Germany, European security, and disarmament were on the agenda for discussion by the leaders of Britain, France, the United States, and the Soviet Union. US President Eisenhower made his Open Skies proposal, suggesting that America and the Soviet Union exchange defense blueprints and allow mutual aerial surveillance in the interests of slowing down the arms race. Nikita Khrushchev did not accept. In the 1955 Moscow Aviation Day air show, Western observers watched a huge swept-wing bomber fly past, powered not by jets, but by turbo-driven propellers. The observers thought it could be little more than a curiosity, and no match for the Mirsishchev bison they had seen the year before, but they were in for a shock. Among an impressive array of Soviet Air Force equipment, they had just glimpsed what would prove to be the world's fastest propeller-driven aircraft, a bomber with a range of almost 8,000 miles, a bomber quite capable of flying across the North Pole and of reaching America. The turboprop engine that gave the bear its speed and range was developed by the Kuznetsov Bureau. Kuznetsov were helped by engineers who had worked with the Junkers Company, recruited from Germany at the end of the war. Between 1950 and 1954, they developed a turbo shaft engine that could produce over 12,000 horsepower and drive a pair of counter-rotating propellers. The propellers themselves were supersonic with automatic pitch change. The combination of engine and propeller was extremely efficient and justified Tupolev's decision to seek long range and high speed through turboprop rather than pure jet power. The bear could fly 100 miles an hour faster than anyone thought possible in a propeller-driven aircraft. It could reach 575 miles an hour. In October 1956, there was a wave of protest across Europe at the severity of Soviet action in crushing Hungary's anti-Soviet revolt. In West Berlin, there was a torch-lit mass meeting. In Paris, the headquarters of the Communist Party was put to the torch. In Holland, the Communist Party's building was stoned. There was a fear in the West that the Soviets were reverting to tactics like those employed by Stalin to keep the Soviet Union together. In March 1958, Nikita Khrushchev who had been first secretary of the Communist Party since the death of Stalin, and the strong man of Soviet politics, consolidated his power even further in the eyes of the West. He was elected premier, replacing Nikolai Bulganin, and becoming the first Soviet leader since Stalin to be premier and party secretary. As he accepted the office, he said, we shall conquer capitalism with a high level of work and a higher standard of living. 
The arrival of the TU-95 Bear in service in the late 50s was a unique achievement for the Tupolev Design Bureau. It was the only turboprop-driven strategic bomber ever to enter first-line service in the world. And it forced change in American defensive thinking. Its potential as a strategic bomber and its potential to reach U.S. soil via the North Pole forced the U.S. to divert money and technology into the construction of interceptor fighter bases and early warning radar sites. The basic model bear was a long-range strategic bomber. It was not as big as the B-52, but was still an enormous aircraft. Its wingspan was nearly 170 feet. Its maximum takeoff weight was 415,000 pounds. It could carry 20,000 pounds of nuclear or free-fall conventional weapons. The bear was a direct descendant of the Tupolev Tu-4 bull, which means that it was also closely related to the American B-29 from which the bull was copied. But superficially, at least, the similarity is not obvious. The bear is a very exotic looking aircraft. The appearance of the bear is dominated by its propellers. They are enormous, 16 and a half feet in diameter, four blades on each propeller, four engines, two propellers driven by each engine revolving in opposite directions, a total of 32 blades. To propel the bear at its maximum speed, they are revolving at 750 revolutions a minute. The speed of the propellers at the tips is Mach 1.08, just over the speed of sound. The Kuznetsov turboprop engines produce almost 15,000 horsepower each. They are housed in long, narrow nacelles fared into the swept wings. The original TU-95, the Bear A, carried its bomb load internally, but the Bear B, introduced into service in the early 60s, could also carry a single large kangaroo air-to-surface missile underneath the fuselage. The kangaroo missile was roughly the size and shape of a MiG-17. It had a range of 400 miles and could travel at twice the speed of sound. The landing gear of the bear had to be extremely long to give the propellers ground clearance. And as in all Soviet military aircraft, it had to be rugged to allow landing on rough, unmade strips. The combination of 32 propeller blades and four extremely powerful turboprop engines made the Bear one of the loudest aircraft in the history of aviation. Its noise echoed round Soviet airfields for miles. There are even stories of American fighter pilots experiencing discomfort because of engine noise from Bears under escort penetrating their cockpit. had a crew of between eight and ten. The number varied depending on the nature of the mission. There were two pilots and one or two navigators. The rest of the crew were radar operators and gunners. 
The gunners and observers at the rear of the aircraft were physically separated from the pilot station at the front by about 50 yards of fuselage. The defensive armament of the basic bear was heavy. It had a remotely controlled turret underneath the fuselage with two cannons. There was a fixed forward firing cannon in the nose. There was a man tail turret with another two cannon. But other versions of the bear, particularly those for maritime reconnaissance, carried less defensive armament. Some naval versions of the bear were not used as weapon systems themselves, but provided targeting data to missile control and guidance stations on board Soviet ships or aircraft that were too far away from their target to aim accurately. Using information from the bears, they could launch their anti-shipping missiles in precisely the right direction. The observation blisters on each side of the rear fuselage were used by gunners to aim the cannon in the remotely controlled turret underneath the aircraft's belly. On versions without the ventral turret, they could be used to house surveillance or photographic equipment. In 1963, bare bees flying over the American fleet near the Azores and off Midway Island were intercepted by American fighters. They were different from the Bear A in that they had long in-flight refueling probes in the nose, and the recesses that were normally occupied by the kangaroo missile were fared over and fitted with camera ports for photographic surveillance. There was also a large blister on the starboard side of the fuselage. The bears were particularly interested in the U.S. carrier's forestal and constellation. And a great deal of film was exposed by both the Soviets and the Americans as the cat and mouse game between fighter and reconnaissance aircraft was played out. The Bear D was identified by NATO in 1967. Uh, these American F-4 Phantoms are shadowing one to take pictures. The Bear D had a large blister fairing under the center of the fuselage. It housed surface search radar. Opportunities to photograph Soviet aircraft in detail were accepted whenever possible by NATO aircraft so that the latest information on development could be analyzed and fed into the identification system. A Soviet manned bomber fleet capable of striking freely around the world had been Stalin's dream. A response to the development of the great American bombers of the late 40s and 50s. Khrushchev's attitude was different. He decided that increasing reliance would be placed on long-range surface-to-surface missiles for the delivery of Soviet nuclear weapons. By the mid-50s, the intercontinental ballistic missile seemed more promising to Khrushchev than the manned bomber. His opinion was shared by other high-ranking military personnel. In 1955, the commander-in-chief of the Soviet Air Force predicted the demise of the manned bomber. He said they were expensive to build, man, and maintain. They had to be housed in large airfields where they were vulnerable to air attack. They tied up large numbers of maintenance personnel and needed great supplies of fuel. Missiles, on the other hand, were cheaper to build, less costly to maintain, easily concealable, and less vulnerable. That view was reinforced in the early 60s. A publication on Soviet military strategy said that the defeat of the enemy's strategic weapons and land forces would largely be achieved by nuclear missile strikes. In the early 60s, some Soviet military academies stopped training bomber crews and instead concentrated on preparing officers for the strategic rocket force. 
long-range bomber personnel began to worry about their careers. But even though under Khrushchev the role of the long-range bomber force was downgraded, it was still in a condition to be revived. Soviet missile development did not proceed as quickly and effectively as Khrushchev wished. Production of the Bear and the Badger continued into the 60s. Bombers were capable of carrying air-launched guided missiles that allowed them to stand off from the target rather than have to penetrate deep into enemy airspace. By the late 60s, a resurgence in belief in the long-range bomber was beginning. While it was accepted that the bear, the badger, and the bison would never penetrate American airspace, they could still easily reach most parts of Europe. With their range supplemented by an efficient system of aerial refueling and their ability to use either standoff weapons or freefall bombs, they were still a major threat to the West. Even when the supersonic backfire and later the blackjack entered service, there was still a place for the bear. In 1984, 30 years after the prototype TU-95 flew, a new variant identified by NATO as Bear H entered service. It could carry a long-range cruise missile and was capable of hitting targets inside the USA without ever entering American airspace. At the time, the Bear H, which appeared with much less fanfare than the supersonic blackjack, was seen as a major threat to Europe and America. The cruise missile it carried, the AS-15, was considered a serious challenge to the American air defense system. After almost 40 years of service, the great rumble of the Bear's engines can still be heard across Russia, Europe, and the oceans of the world. These days, they are even becoming welcome guests at some of the world's great air shows, giving Western audiences a close-up look at one of the most extraordinary aircraft ever built. In the Soviet Union, most major civil aircraft were developed from military designs. The extraordinary TU-114 airliner was a development of the TU-95 Bear. It entered service in the early 60s and could carry up to 220 passengers. This is not just any field in Russia. It's part of the Monino Air Force Museum outside Moscow where one of these giant Soviet airliners is part of the collection. In 1959, a TU-114 flew Nikita Khrushchev from Moscow to New York non-stop. The 4,162 miles were covered in 11 hours in a propeller-driven aircraft. At the time, it was the largest and heaviest commercial airliner in the world. It remained in service until the late 60s, flying international routes to France, Canada, India, and Japan, competing successfully with a new generation of jet airlines. 